Hey friends, it is 1.59 and we are live. I'm going to wait until two o'clock before I get started. So it is 1.59. If you are here early with us, this is a free motion quilting class, lesson one. We have two others scheduled. So in this particular class, it is a sew along style. So I hope that you're going to get all of your sewing supplies ready and you're going to join me for this sew along. So it is 1.59 at the top of the hour. I'm going to start the class. So go grab your sewing stuff, get something to drink, run to the bathroom, and we're going to get started in just a minute. All right. So tell me who's out there. So we are live. There's a chat box that you can type your questions into. I will check into the chat box every so often. I see Lolita and I see Marsha. There are a total of 17 people live with us right now, so that is exciting. Welcome to the Jelly Roll Club. And we have Anita in the room with us, which is awesome. Okay, so grab your stuff and let's go through what you need. Hi, Kelly. So Kelly Thompson is saying hello. If you know how to use the chat feature, drop your name in the chat and let me know uh, where you're from and how long you have been quilting. And if this is your first time doing free motion, this class is for you because I'm going to teach you the basics from start to finish. I see Carol, I see Trudy, Chris, and Robin. Hi, everybody. Okay, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some basic quilting supplies. Then I'm going to set up my machine. I'm going to show you how to do that. And then behind me is the panel that I'm going to be working on because it's going to be the cover of my journal. So I'm making a journal cover today. So that's why I'm free motion quilting. So hopefully you have read the instructions that said your supplies. See, who do we have? We have Robin. Uh, and she's this is her first time free motion quilting. And we have Kathy and Lisa. Welcome. Uh, Lisa from California. I grew up in Whittier, California. Lisa, welcome. I don't know if you're from Southern California or Northern California. And then we have Julie from Quebec, new to quilting and free motion. And then we have Kelly. All right, friends. So let's get started. First things first are your supplies. I'm going to rotate my camera downward so you can see what I've got. So I've got the blank table in front of me and I want to show you a few things. To get started today, you're going to need at least one full bobbin of thread and your bobbin case. If you happen to have some of these little silicone discs that go inside your bobbin case, great. I use them because it keeps my uh, thread inside my bobbin case from tangling. It lets it slide in there freely. It acts like a lubricant. And when you're free motion quilting, you can be going quite fast sometimes. And so welcome to Lisa from San Diego. Awesome. Now, your sewing machine today will require a darning foot. Some of you are familiar with this foot on most sewing machines. This is called a walking foot. You can do a lot of amazing quilting with this foot. But for free motion quilting today, if you have a darning foot that looks like this or like this, you can buy them quite inexpensively. I think these plastic, this plastic one here that I got was like $10. This one was a little bit more. Um, these go on my low shank machines, and then this one goes on my high shank machine that I'm using. So check to see if you have a darning foot. Um, it should have a hole in the middle, and this one has a hole in the middle and a little um, guide. Most of the free motion feet look like this. They have a little um, hole that's elongated and maybe two little marks. But I actually like to snap a mine off like this because it makes it easier to access the spot and view what I'm quilting. So don't be afraid to take a couple of uh, pliers and just snap that center off of your foot. And we have Katie from Kentucky, Marsha, and then we have Lily from uh, Ontario, Canada. Welcome to Free Motion Quilting. So this is your basics, right? You need this. You also need plenty of thread, my friends. The thread that I am using today is just a Guterman cotton quilting thread in a spool. And I'm going to be using um, two colors on mine. So I'm using a gray. So I've already wound one of these. I'm going to use a gray in my bobbin. 
because my backing fabric is gray or pale gray. So I wanna match my bobbin uh, to my backing. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna bring my backing so you can see what that looks like. And I'm using this right here. So you, you can see it's several colors of gray. When I lay that gray thread on there, it basically disappears. And that's what I want because uh, when you're a brand new free motion quilter, you're going to make boo-boos. And I don't want you to, to upset yourself because this takes time to master. And so if you have a thread that kind of blends in and is almost invisible on the backing, that's perfect. And when you guys have all of your supplies, you let me know. So that's to get started. The next thing that you're going to need today is something that's grippy for your hand. Um, you can use something like this which are like grippy fingers that I picked up at the Dollar Tree. So you need something so that your fingers can grip the fabric and move it around. In my case, let me open this up. I picked up these little grippy fingers from the Dollar Tree. And these are easy to use. They just slip on your fingers like this. If you don't wanna wear gloves, you don't have to. You don't even have to wear them on all your fingers, maybe just a couple of your fingers and you can wear those grippy fingers so you can move your fabric easier. And those are those are grippy fingers and those are from the Dollar Tree. So nothing fancy here. I always give you pointers on how to do things in the least expensive way possible. If you happen to have drawer liner at home and you don't have grippy fingers, this is also a great thing for free motion quilting because you can lay your hands on this and you can use that to move your fabric. So if you have some of this drawer liner, just cut a couple pieces, save them for yourself in the sewing room. Um, my pieces are usually about three by three and I just stick my hand under there and then I can push my fabric just like that. So this is a great little thing to use when you're free motion quilting. The other thing you can use are inexpensive garden gloves, like the kind you get from the dollar store. So slip these on, they should fit nice and snug. So your gloves should fit nice and snug, just like that. And those can also be used to free motion quilt. Now, if you happen to have a place like Joanne Fabrics, sometimes you can pick a, a coupon up and they have these little Fonz and Porter gloves. So as you can see, I do a lot of free motion quilting. And these little gloves have rubber dots all over the bottom. And these are very snug and they're like a, a lightweight cotton. And so these can also be used for free motion quilting. But these are some basic supplies. So if you have gloves and you have a darning foot for your sewing machine and some thread, that's all you need to get started. So let's, let's get our machine ready. So let's see who's with us. We have Patricia from New Orleans, Linda, Joy, Katie, Marsha, Lily, Welcome to Free Motion Quilting. Okay, so now we've got to prep our fabric. So we have everything that we need for our machine and now we've got to prep our fabric. If you notice, I have this inexpensive cart that I bought. It's like one of those little utility carts. I use that when I quilt because I put that behind my little gidget table that my machine sits on like this. And I use that to hold the weight of the fabric, especially when we're doing a big quilt. In this episode of live, we are doing a smaller size project. Like in this case, I'm doing a, a small panel. You can do a table runner to start, but in the next lesson, I'm gonna show you how to baste a larger quilt or a, a, a larger project and get it done on your machine. You can do a, a twin size, even a queen comfortably on a machine as long as it has decent harp space and this is harp space. This is Big Bertha. She's my PQ 1500. She retails for about $699. So you don't have to have uh, a $10,000 machine to quilt. All right, so let me show you. These are great projects to get started. This is my double wedding ring table runner that I've been working on. So if you've been making that with me, this is the project that you will see me quilt next time because I'm gonna show you how to prep a bigger uh, project with dissolving thread. But for today, we're gonna to start with the basics and so I'm gonna set this one aside. Okay, what kinds of things do you need to spend money on? Not a lot. 
Don't spend a million dollars on your hobby. You don't have to, to enjoy it. But for today, I'm going to use this panel. The reason I'm using this panel is because it has all of these lovely shapes. And look at the shapes of this panel. If you can find an inexpensive panel on clearance, I didn't pay a whole lot for this. I got it off the clearance rack. But it gives me the opportunity to go through here and do some practice stitching on all of those uh, leaves. And this is a really beautiful panel. I like how it looks. And when I folded it in one fourth, I really love how it looks. And so this is going to become a book cover for me. So whether I decide to do it as a Bible cover or I decide to do it as a junk journal cover, I think that I'm going to use it like this so that one side of the book is like this and the other side of the book is like this. And so that's what I'm going to do this. So I'm going to uh, free motion quilt it and then I'm going to cut it into four pieces because this will end up being a book cover. Um, this could be a great thing for a wallet. So if I wanted to make a wallet, um, a phone case. So if you have fabric like this that you practice free motion, you can make yourself a little padded phone case, maybe an eyeglass holder if you're like me and you need to wear your eyeglasses as you get older. These are great little things that you can do with your practice free motion pieces. All right, so that's just our basics to get started. So now let's talk about what you need to quilt. Now, some people will tell you to get all kinds of supplies. They'll say, get basting uh, spray and, and buy this and buy that. And typically that's because they're trying to sell you something. I'm trying to sell you nothing. And so I'm gonna teach you how to do your hobby or how to do free motion quilting with the least amount of money possible. All right, batting. The best kind of batting for smaller free motion projects is 100% needle punched cotton. Why do I use 100% needle punched cotton? Because it grips the fabric. And so I don't have the need for a bunch of sprays when I use some really nice 100% cotton batting. And I like to use natural materials in my quilts. Um, I tend to use mostly 100% cotton or a combination of wool and cotton or an 80-20. I do not use polyester on my projects. Over time, it tends to beard and sometimes uh, end up a little bit uh, distorted. And so I tend to use cotton because it holds its shape a whole lot better. All right, so I have, who do we have here? We have Lori from North Carolina and visiting. So just observing, that's fine. You can sew whenever you want to. You don't have to sew today, but this is sew along style. So that's just the basics, okay? Here are your other supplies that you need for free motion quilting, is you need a table with an extension. And we have somebody from Tennessee that just joined us. So I'll check in with you in a minute. If you have a table that, that has a sewing machine that has an extension table, that is awesome. So if you look at this machine behind you, it came with a nice big white table. But if you don't have a great big wide table like this, don't panic because you can actually make an extension table for your sewing machine with foam core from the Dollar Tree. You uh, trace around the bed of your machine and you make one piece of foam core on here. You trace another one and then you fill it with stuffing and you can put duct tape and you can make yourself an extension table from the Dollar Tree. So if your machine didn't come with, with a nice extension table like mine did, um, you can certainly make your own. The other option is for you to buy a table and the table that I have down below, here, let me see if you can see it. The table that I have down below has a hole in it. So this little Gidget table I bought, I didn't pay a whole lot of money. Some tables like this one have a little spot underneath where you can drop your machine down and, and make it lower. So if you're setting up for the first time, make sure that you have a nice, big, comfortable space because you want to be able to move your fabric freely across the space and that makes it easier. All right, so now we're gonna prep our machine. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add my darning foot and I'm gonna tighten that up. At this point, I'm gonna drop my feed dogs. So if your machine has feed dogs that drop, I want you to drop those feed dogs. And mine has a button over here 
and those feed dogs went all the way down. So when I stick my hand in there, I should feel nothing. And when I uh, step on the foot pedal, I should feel nothing as well. The next thing that I'm going to ask you to do is swap your needle. So if you have not changed your needle on your, on your machine in a little while, you're going to need to swap your needle. And what kinds of needles do you need? So let's look at my little needle basket. I use needles all the time. Since we are free motion quilting, the needle that I want you to use is I want you to find through your needles if you have a quilting needle like this. So if you have quilting needle, that's great. So I buy a lot of quilting needles in different sizes. This is a 7511. If you notice, this one comes in two sizes. It's like 90 and 75. 90 is your bigger needle. 75 is your smaller. The bigger needle, um, the more it can pierce. They also have these embroidery needles. These work great as well. So if you cannot find a quilting needle, you can use an embroidery needle or you can use a top stitch needle and a top stitch needle like in an 80, which is like a midsize. Do not use a universal. If you have universal, pull it out of there. The tip on a universal is kind of um, dull compared to a quilting needle if you look it under um, a magnifying glass. And what happens is, is that you'll get skipped stitches because it doesn't pierce cleanly through all of the layers. So I'm going to find myself uh, probably an 80-12 top, top stitch needle. And I'm going to grab myself a fresh needle every single time. So I'm going to pull that out. So if you have not switched out your needle on your machine, you need to go ahead and do that at this time. Trudy said she has a so steady table. Trudy, I love so steady tables. Um, you can't see it in here because I'm in my office so that I can have access to a computer and the router and all that stuff so I can do these live events without getting a shaky video. But I actually have a kangaroo cabinet and I have another machine, a Bernina, that drops into my kangaroo cabinet. And I love using that for sewing as well. So yeah, if you can afford a sew steady table, they're not too ridiculous, a hundred, a little over a hundred dollars. That is great. All right, switch your needle friends and let me know when you're ready. So I will check the chat and you let me know when you are ready, Freddie, after you have swapped out your needle. I tell you what, the older I get, the more my arthritis is starting to get to me and the harder it is to do things like swap my needles. There we go. All right. Dull needle out, new needle in. All right. So I am pushing that all the way up, making sure it's seated securely. Tighten it, but don't get ridiculous and make it so that you can't get that out. So there you go. Fresh needle. Have a system for figuring out which ones are your old needles and your new needles. And there you go. All right. So that is my sewing machine. And I'm going to turn off the light because it leaves kind of a glare and it makes it hard for you to see what I'm doing. So I'm going to turn off my light temporarily. Um, and I'm going to prepare my bed. So... A lot of machine quilters that you see will recommend a product called a super slider. And I have a super slider. It is really a good piece of equipment. I have a machine downstairs that I've dedicated strictly for free motion quilting and I have a super slider on it. But sometimes they're hard to find depending on where you live, what country you're at. Um, and they're, they can be a little bit pricey. And so I said, what if I had an alternative? Because I like to travel. I don't know about you, but I like to travel when I quilt. And so I don't always need to take a whole bunch of supplies. I can find inexpensive alternatives. So if you have Press and Seal from Glad, it works just like a super slider. Just like a super slider. Now, somebody just asked in the chat, what happens if your feed dogs do not drop? What can you do? 
they sell um, little, one of my sewing machines is a vintage sewing machine and the feed dogs do not drop. What I found was a little plastic piece that actually screws onto my machine and covers the feed dog. So this is called a feed dog cover and it literally sells for like $5. It's made out of plastic. And what it does is it allows the needle to go through the hole, um, but it covers your feed dogs. If you don't have that, the little cardboard that comes on your needles serves just the same. So if you will take uh, the little cardboard off of your needles and you take a pair of scissors, you can actually fold them in half just like this. And I'll show you. You can take them on the bed of your machine where your feed dogs are. Let me bring that closer so you guys can see my machine. Is that a good angle for you guys? Can you guys see? You can actually take and you can take some tape and you can cover with a little bit of painter's tape where the feed dogs come up and down and all you have to leave are is the little hole. So you can take this and you can tape it on the front and the back just like this. So if you have a couple of these, if you have a couple of business cards, this is a, a great time to use those. Any kind of cardboard that you use, so like cardboard like this, like the cardboard that just came on my little super sliders, I could actually take that little piece of cardboard as long as you're not blocking the hole. And I could use a little bit of painter's tape and cover those up like that. What I want to leave is that opening unobstructed where my needle goes up and down. So there's a little hole, there's a little hole in the center. And so you want that to be unobstructed. And so if you don't, if your feed dogs do not drop down, you can still do this. So that's not a problem. Um, and all you need is a little bit of tape to, to take care of that. So if your feed dogs didn't drop, you watch me, I just took literally this where my needles were folded in half. Take a little bit of clear tape and I'm going to, the tape is not on my feed dogs, but right behind where they go. And I'm gonna put one there and I'm gonna put one on the other side and that's if your feed dogs do not drop. And then I'm gonna take another little piece of cardboard that was on those other things and I'm gonna put them here. And so what, what I'm doing is I'm literally building one of these little guys right here. But if your feed dogs don't drop, check to see if you can get a feed dog guard for your machine. This fits on my vintage machine and it literally just uh, has two little things that go down and it covers those feed dogs. So this is a feed dog cover, okay? And so that's what you want. You want to be able to move that freely. My feed dogs drop, so I'm gonna take that off of there. I don't need it but I'm gonna show you how to put press and seal on the bed of your machine. So if you have a so steady table or you have an extension table on your machine, you will just grab some press and seal because it has a little bit of tackiness to it and it's only $3 and you can use it hundreds and hundreds of times. Um, well, I mean, I use it a lot. And so then you're just gonna unroll this a little tricky to find the end on this guy. Let's see if we can find it. There we go. And you're just going to pull it up. It has a sticky side and a super slick side. So I'm just going to pull that out. And I'm going to cover my, my space on my machine with presses. So I'm gonna take some of this and I'm literally just gonna put it right here over my, uh, the bed of my machine, right over my extension table. I do not wanna cover the hole, but what I'm doing is I'm creating a very slippery surface. So I'm gonna pull this tight And I'm gonna give it a couple little pieces of tape 
Press and seal usually holds pretty well. Sometimes if it's exposed to heat, it might not, but I just make sure that I get a good slippery surface. That's what I'm going for here is the really slippery surface so that my quilt project will slide around on there. And so then I'm gonna pull another piece of press and seal and I'm gonna put it on the other side of the bed of my machine. So I'm just gonna kind of measure that. So quilting does not have to be expensive. There's so many things that you can use that are kitchen items, that are items that you can find at your grocery store or the Dollar Tree. And so the main thing is, is I'm trying to cover the entire bed of my machine with that press and seal. And so I've covered that up. Now I have to make sure that the little hole where my... Uh, feed dogs were, doesn't get obstructed. So I'm gonna make sure that I cut out a little spot so that I'm not blocking where my sewing machine needle goes up and down. Okay, so that's unobstructed there. And I've got it covering everywhere and I'm gonna tape it down the sides just a little bit right here. Just to stretch it tight and to keep it from lifting when I'm sewing. And this comes right up. You can use regular clear tape, Christmas tape, uh, painter's tape. It doesn't really matter. And so there we go. Now my surface is ready, right? Ready to rumble. Get that as close as I can and come up here. All right, friends. So now I've got to get my backing ready, right? Your backing for your project should be, and I'm going back over here. So your backing for your project should be a couple of inches bigger all the way around. Let me get to this camera. There we go. I was sideways. Should be a little bit bigger all the way around. In my case, I have a panel that's like 22 inches wide. And that's what I'm going to be doing. So I need to make sure that I have a backing that's at least as wide. And I always check to make sure it's straight of grain. Now, this is important. In order for you to free motion quilt, you're going to have to take this backing and you're going to have to give it a good press. And then you have to make your quilt sandwich. So I'm going to show you really quick how I make my quilt sandwich. First, I'm going to take, I have a Teflon pressing cloth. I use Teflon to make sure that my stuff doesn't end up sticky. I have my batting and I have my front. So I'm going to take, and I'm going to move anything under here that I don't want to get through. And I'm going to use a little bit of magic sizing. So for my uh, quilt tops, I use magic sizing. I do not use starch because it can attract critters. And so I will get everything pressed and ready. The top has already been pressed, so I don't need to do that, but I'm gonna press this bottom. So I pull my wool mat under me, and I'm gonna press this and use a Teflon sheet. And the reason I use a Teflon sheet is because I don't like things sticking to my top. So I'm gonna use a little bit of magic sizing I'm gonna give it a little spray. I'm gonna smooth it with my hands. And then I'm gonna take my pressing cloth and get those wrinkles out. I don't want it to be too stiff. If your backing or your quilt top are excessively stiff, I mean, to the point some people starch their quilts to death to the point where they're crunchy, it makes it really hard to move it around and manipulate it underneath your needle. So then I just make sure that I have no wrinkles in this top. And I press it, smooth it with my hands. You can use Best Press. They sell it by the gallon. Sometimes you can use a coupon and get it 40% off. 
or you can use Magic Sizing, and those are the two products that I recommend. Give it a light spray, not too much, just so that it, it, it's crisp and it has a body to it. But probably the most important thing related to quilting is the quality of your fabric. This fabric here is Art Gallery Fabric, uh, which is a nice brand, and so when I feel this fabric, it's good and thick, so it's going to hold its shape as I'm quilting, so I don't have to use as much starch. If you have a lower grade um, cotton, sometimes they're so thin that you're going to have to put a little bit more um, effort into getting them to where they're nice and thick, but you can feel the weight on this, and it's nice and heavy. And so this is what I'm going to do to my back. I'm just going to make sure it's pressed well. And I love having this little utility cart next to me when I sew because I can put all my supplies. I can use it as a cutting or a pressing station. I love my wool pressing mat. This is what I have underneath. I just ordered a horse pad, the kind that goes underneath a saddle. And it's uh, 30, 30 by 30, so I'm looking forward to getting that in the mail. Because it was only $25 and I'm going to be able to cover this entire table with a wool mat. So I got it at a horse supply company online. So I'm excited about that. All right, so you want to make sure that your backing is pressed. There are no wrinkles in it. And I press it in both directions, going up and going down. You don't need a giant space to quilt. A lot of people assume that you need a humongous house to quilt in. You do not. The little office that I'm in right now is an office that's like 12 by 12. And it has my computer table and this sewing machine and all kinds of stuff. And I use this space when I do uh, recorded sessions and live sessions because it's more convenient to be right here next to my router so that I don't get shaky video. Sometimes you see that when people go live and their video is shaking is because there's not enough bandwidth. And so I want to make sure that you can see what's going on. So this looks pretty good. Doesn't have any wrinkles. It lays nice and straight. And so now I'm going to put it with the right side to the outside, right? Right side to the outside. And I see now I'm checking it on the other side. And it didn't look wrinkled on the other side, but now when I check the back side, I see that there's still a few more wrinkles. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a press on this side. And just check your fabric. It's better to spend extra time prepping than not enough. There we go. And so I'm going to make sure that I get that big wrinkle out of there because I don't want that to turn into a puck, a, a pucker or a tuck on the back of my quilt. All right. And that looks pretty good. All right. So now I'm going to take my batting. And I'm going to lay it across the top of here. And there's a little bit extra batting. And I'm going to make sure that this is ultra smooth. Ultra smooth. This is a book cover. So I want it to be a little bit thicker. So I'm doubling up my quilt batting. And then I'm just going to make sure that my quilt bat is as smooth as I can get it. Sometimes I'll even press my batting to get the big wrinkles out of it in a smaller project. So your batting, you should let, unroll it and let it rest. And you can also give your batting a quick little press. When we do the next session, I will show you how to roll your batting onto a pool noodle. And I will show you how to baste using either sticks or pool noodles, and it will be super easy for you to baste giant quilts. All right. I've got my fabric, and I've got my quilt batting. 
and I've got my back. And so now I want to make sure that I have extra, which I do. And then I want to make sure that my piece of batting is sufficient to cover the entire area that I'm going to be quilting. And so I'm going to bring my, uh, my measuring tool I'm going to use right now is my board. This is 12 by 18. So I'm going to lay this in the middle and I'm going to feel my batting and I have extra batting all the way around. So I like how that sits there because I want to make sure that I have enough batting to go outside of the area that I'm going to be quilting. And now I'm going to secure these three layers together. So I have to secure all three layers. I have an excess on this side that's way too much, and then I have an excess on that side. So what I'm going to do really quick is I'm going to rip this fabric off because I don't need it. And so I will snip it off on the straight of grain. And so I'm going to grab a little pair of scissors. I'm going to make a snip into the into the cellar, and I'm just going to pull. That's how you get a straight of grain cut. There you go. And when you press that, that edge, that is a nice straight of grain cut. I'm going to use this for another part of my journal, so I'm going to save this. it under here. So I have enough sticking out on that side. I have enough sticking out on that side. All right. Now it's time to baste it. You can baste it in a variety of ways, but the easiest way is with pins. Some people will spray baste. I find that spray basting over time gums up the needle on your machine and it makes it really hard to clean off of there. You have to use isopropyl alcohol and a lot of other things. So for me, I just tend to use just straight pins and I keep these little curved, I don't know if you can see them, little curved safety pins that look just like this. So when I close them, they look just like that. They're just like a little curve in them. And so that's what I use for mine. I start in the middle right here of this project and I'm gonna put a pin all the way through all three layers and pull it up always pushing outward from my project to make sure that I have no puckers or wrinkles. And I'm gonna put this in a grid. So I start in the middle and I work out, and then I start in the middle and I work this way. And by doing it in a grid, that ensures that you can keep smoothing that and you're gonna get no wrinkles. And I'm pushing it taut. I'm pushing it really, really taut. I'm going to rotate this project. This is easy to do when you have a small project like this, but this can also be done with a larger project. It's not a problem. And I check the back to make sure I have no uh, puckers or tucks and I don't. And then I just keep pushing it with my hands like this to make sure that I have uh, no wrinkles in my batting and no wrinkles in my fabric. Sometimes I'll clamp it on this table like this with a couple of clamps. Um, and then I will pull it tight and then pin it. And you can do that too. So if you have, like I said, if you have a place near you, you can use a couple of little clamps like this and you can clamp it on the side and that helps you. So if you have a couple of little, these inexpensive clamps you get from the hardware store, you can do that. But I want to put a few pins but not get excessive because I don't want them in the way when I'm free motion quilted. And so I'm securing all three layers. I'm going from the center to the outside. Sometimes it helps to use bigger pins if you have arthritic hands. And I'm pushing all of that outward. And I'm giving the back a little tug. And 
How's it going out there? How are you doing with your quilt sandwich? Are you getting it, getting it pinned, getting it secured? When you buy pins, um, buy the rust proof pins because there's nothing more tragic than having to put a project away and then the humidity, especially in the summertime, can cause pins to rust right in your material. So if you can buy uh, coated pins that are rust proof, that would be great. Galvanized pins or pins that have a zinc coating because you don't want your pins to rest in your fabric. And they can. Some inexpensive pins can do that. Okay. So I've got all three layers secured. I've got enough fabric on both sides of my project. I've got batting in all of the areas where I'm going to quilt. Um, in many cases, you can put the batting outside. If this were a full-size quilt, I would want my batting and my backing to stick out several inches on both sides because you do lose a little bit of fabric to shrinkage when you are quilting. Okay. That, my friends, is my sandwich it is ready to go i'm going to cut off the excess that i have hanging off over here because i don't want that getting in the way and i'm ready to go to my machine and if i look on the back there are no tucks or, or puckers and i am ready to go all right so, how's everybody doing? So here we are, right? Bed of my machine has a nice slick surface. Um, the reason I use press and seal is because I got happy one day and I put stickers on the bed of my machine and I shouldn't have, but I did. So now I use stuff. So either way, drop the feed dogs, have that new needle, get it ready, right? I'm gonna thread my machine with quilting thread. In this case, I'm gonna be using a thread for the top of my machine that's, it's called a metro seam. So the metro seam thread is one that is glossy because if you look at my project, you can see that it's super brightly colored and I'm gonna tuck that underneath there. You can see that it's super brightly colored. And so I want a color that shows off my stitches. If you are a new quilter, you may want a color that blends in. What colors blend in? Nine out of 10 times, it's gonna be gray. So if I have a gray thread and I lay that across here, it doesn't, it doesn't hide in this particular quilt. So in most cases, you're gonna wanna find something that just kind of blends in once you start stitching. And that one doesn't look too bad in most places. So you're gonna to wanna to just lay that across here and just check. Um, this one, maybe not, maybe, maybe not. Always have the prerogative ladies to change your mind in the middle of a project, that's fine too. So then I have this one. Um, I like this Metro scene by Mettler, so I use this. This is a thinner thread than the one I had before. So this thread is a 60 weight. Um, most threads that you use are a 50 weight. So if you look at your Aurafil, which I use for piecing, this is a 50 weight. This is a 60 weight. 60 is thinner and it will disappear when you stitch. And so this one sometimes is better for quilting, especially if you're doing micro quilting. So if you're doing little tiny bubbles or little tiny stipples, you're gonna want a thinner thread. This is uh, gonna be a book cover. So I think I'm gonna use this little Metro scene yellow, but that also means I'm gonna have to go slower so that I don't break my thread. I could do this one, which is a taupe and it's a 50 weight, that's a good thread. And so both of these are good options, but I think I'm gonna stick with this yellow. And so I have a gray at the bottom in my bobbin to go with my gray back, because I have a gray back. So this is the back. It has gray. And on top, I'm going to use this Mettler 60 weight Metro seam. All right, friends. 
you should always do a fresh threading of your machine when you start quilting. So if your machine has been threaded, make sure that you completely unthread the machine. When you're starting this, make sure you completely unthread it and you thread it from scratch. Because what that will do is it will ensure that your machine is threaded correctly and that you are um, not going to get a twisted thread. So make sure you thread it completely. In my case, mine has to go through several loops. So I put those in there. And then you're gonna make sure your thread is not twisted as it's coming off the spool and that it goes through all the tension discs. In this case, I'm gonna put it through all three tensioning loops on my machine And I'm going to um, check the tension on this machine before I get started because this is a different thread than what I normally use. So I'm going to make sure that I go through here. That I'm carefully threading the machine. And I'm going to test the tension before I start in the middle of my project. Because there's nothing more sad then starting in your project and then all of a sudden the tension on your sewing machine is not right. And then you're having to try to figure out how you're going to unpick all the stuff you just stitched because that's tragic. Okay. So mine is threaded and it's ready to go. So this is my machine and I'm ready to start my quilting process. So I'm going to move all this stuff out of my way because I want nothing in the way. And I'm going to test my tension on a little piece of scrap. So I'm going to get a little piece of fabric. I can test it off of an edge. I can test it over here off the bottom. But I'm going to go ahead and test my tension. So I'm going to go down here in a spot where it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to use it on my project over here in a little corner. And I'm going to test my tension. Number one rule of free motion quilting is pulling up your bobbin thread. So I'm going to turn this light off so that you can see me pull up my bobbin thread. I'm going to turn it off because that will enable you to see. Pulling up your bobbin thread means that you're taking the thread and you're pulling it up. So you're going to hold this about six inches in your hand, like this on your left hand. You're going to drop your needle with your... Um, with your flywheel, you're going to drop it down and then you're going to pull it up. And when it pulls up, you're going to hang on to that needle and you're going to pull it towards you and you're going to want to pull that thread in. And see, mine didn't want to do that. So that means it's not engaging. So I'm going to pull it again. And I want to make sure it's not for whatever reason I didn't pull enough thread underneath. So this is why you test it. You don't just start sewing without testing it. So I'm going to stick my hand under there and I'm going to pull my bobbin case out. And it's okay that I've taped everything because it'll go back in. And I'm going to check it and I didn't pull enough thread. So I'm going to need to make sure that thread is pulled out and then I've seated it correctly. So. Don't worry, folks. You'll get the hang of it. All right. Now, let's try that again. And if you notice, my needle doesn't want to catch. That means something is off. I either put my needle in incorrectly or... Something else is going on with my uh, machine. So I'm going to put my glasses on because little old people need their um, to see what's going on. And I'm going to inspect this needle to make sure that I put it in correctly. So it should have, in my case, it should be sideways, the eye of the needle. And then I'm going to thread it and I'm going to test it to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing.
Murphy's Law, right? Anything that can go wrong, we're live, and this is what happens. All right, so down it goes, and now it's caught. There we go. And now it pulled up, so I don't know if you saw that, but I'm going to show you really quick, and I'm going to hold my camera really close. So when you see that, that bobbin thread is coming up from the bottom. And so now I'm just going to take a little screwdriver, any tool, a stiletto, and I'm going to pull that bobbin thread up because you want it out here, right? You want that bobbin thread out here. When you are quilting, you're going to have lots of starts and stops. And you have to pull your bobbin thread up towards the top every time. And I'm going to show you in the second lesson how to bury those. Because if you just snip it right at the surface, over time, your quilting will um, come apart. And then you will not have nice, neat stitches. You'll have just a big, fat mess. Okay. So I have my bobbin thread is up here with me. And I have my uh, big, long piece of thread on top. So now I'm just going to check my tension really quick. So I'm going to sink it down and I'm going to hold it with my hands and I'm going to give it a couple of stitches. So I'm going to go one, two. Okay, that looks like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. I'm going to reduce my stitch length over here to 1.75 uh, instead of a 2.5 like I normally do. And I'm going to go ahead and put on my gloves that I'm going to use, and I'm going to start checking to see what my tension looks like. So now I'm going to hold my hands beside my piece of, of machine, and I'm going to move them by opening my hands like this and using steady pressure. So I'm going to go like this, and I'm going to move it just like a hair, and I'm going to check the tension really quick to see what my machine is doing. I'm going to pull this up and I'm going to check it to see if I like what it's doing and that looks like it's okay. I'm going to reduce my stitch length a little bit and I'm going to use my scissors to snip all of these threads. So you have this thread, you're going to leave a little tail because you're going to bury those later. So I'm going to leave my thread and I'm going to snip it just a hair. I'm going to come in and my bobbin thread in the back, I'm going to snip it just a hair and I'm going to want to pull it. I'm going to pull my thread because what I want is I want to leave a long tail. Normally you don't, but when you're quilting, you do. Okay. So now I'm ready. My tension looks like it's good. I'm going to check my tension on the back. I'm not getting any eyelashing. It looks like I'm ready to machine quilt. All right, where you start on every project is in the middle. So you start in the middle of your quilt. So whether you're quilting a queen size or a twin or even a, a just a table runner or a panel, always start in the middle and work your way to the right and then work your way to the left. Always rotating it, keeping the least amount of fabric over here in the heart. Does anybody have any questions? I'd be glad to stop and answer any questions that you have about quilting right now. So does anybody have any questions right now? I'm gonna check the chat to see what you guys have been saying. So we have uh, Linda, we have Marsha, Patricia, we have Kate, Trudy, we have Malia, hi Malia, Giselle, Bettina, we have Brenda and Kate. Let me know if you have any questions there are 42 people with us in this live lesson. And so just let me know if you have any questions. All right. Okay, friends, now it's time for the actual quilting. So now that I have tested my machine, I have a fresh needle, I have my thread, I have everything that I need, I can start imagining the design that I'm going to do on this particular piece. And I'm going to stop right now and I'm going to show you a little bit about designing your uh, quilt design. So I'm going to stop right now because everything is ready and set up for us to sew. But I'm going to show you 
how to envision a design for your book. And probably the easiest thing in the world for you to do is for you to use just plain graph paper or notebook paper. And I'm going to get mine out and I'm going to pull my camera down here and I'm going to rotate it down. So I have my book. So as you can see, this is literally just graph paper. I use this notebook for all kinds of quilt ideas and ideations. I draft my own patterns usually on paper and then I make uh, lots of notes. And so this is the birthplace of many, many projects is just this page here. I often will draw my quilt blocks like this and sketch them out and do a lot of math calculations and entire tops out. But this is also a great place to sketch a design. The area that I'm working with in this particular panel, so if you look at my panel over here, the area that I'm working with is about a six by six. So I'm gonna take and I'm gonna look on my graph paper and I'm gonna kind of sketch out a six by six area. Now, I could do this a couple of ways. I could actually mark a design on my quilt top and here I have washout uh, cloth markers. As you can see, I quilt a lot, and so I use these. Always test a marker before you use it on your quilt because some of these do not wash out. Um, this one says clean erase. Um, I've used this several times. It does clean erase. These are washable, like this is a blue soluble pencil, so it washes away with water but sometimes these don't and you cannot iron these. Some of these, when you iron them, will leave permanent marks on your fabric. So always be careful when you use marking tools, but you can use this air soluble marker or any of these types of quilting pencils. And I have them in white, red and blue because you can mark on a variety of fabrics with them. So I use those, but let's look at our design. It really helps for you to, to envision your quilt design before you do it. And the reason I tell you that is because it's easier for you to erase a piece of paper than for you to unpick a ton of stitches. So the first time that you do this, just kind of visualize this. This is a, a little six inch ruler. And I'm just gonna draw a little six inch square for myself right on this graph paper. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to visualize what it is that I'm going to do on that flower over there. Your uh, particular piece, if you're doing a table runner or something, may have um, a grid on it. But this is the space that I'm going to concentrate on. Because if I put on my gloves and I quilt, the space that you can manageably quilt is about a six inch space. So about the space that fits between your hands. So if you look at my hands, six inches, right? Or basically the, the full length of my hand is very manageable. So if I'm moving my fabric, this is what I'm trying to, to do. I'm trying to quilt a space that's about six by six, and that's what I'm gonna start with. So I'm gonna plan this out. One of the things that I could do is I could start from the middle and move to each of the four corners and then come back. I could also do a filler. Maybe I wanna do a feather because in this particular case, I have like a, a thing that looks round. So I have a rounded space. So I may wanna do a feather. A feather is uh, simply you start here in the middle and I would work my way out to one corner, right? So I start my feather. This is an imaginary line. This is not your quilting line. I would start here and I would simply loop out and come back. Loop out and come back. I would travel like this with my needle and I would loop out and come back. Then I would loop out and come back. And so what you're doing is you're trying to draw a design without ever lifting your pencil. So I'm just doing kind of a loose feather of what I would be quilting if I were doing it with my sewing machine. So I'm just trying to visualize like how big of a loop do I want? Do I want to do a feather? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. 
but a feather is simply made by traveling down a line. And so I always kind of practice before I get on my sewing machine. So maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want to just quilt uh, loops. So maybe my uh, design will have kind of a concentric design. I can rotate like this. And I can do the same thing on all four sides. I'm just doing it really fast. So maybe I can just draw and visualize what it is that I want to do. Maybe I want to do a vine. Maybe when I get to the end of this vine, I'm going to want to travel. And traveling is something that you're going to talk about a lot if you're free motion quilting. So maybe you're going to get to the end of your design and then you're just going to travel and you're going to come across here and then you're going to fill this in. So maybe we want to fill this in with some big loops like this. And then we get back to the middle and now I can do another one of these corners. So maybe that's the design that I want to do like this. And so I can go all the way across here, I can travel, and I can actually do my feather in this order and then come back over here, do it here, fill this section. And so I'm working in a grid. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? Maybe the design that I wanna do is more simple. Because there's a lot of movement and this particular pattern that I have is like a flower that comes out like this with petals. Maybe what I want to do is I just want to fill those petals. So maybe I want to do a wavy flame and I'm going to come in like this to the middle and I'm going to do this going all the way out and I'm doing this with my needle until I get back to the center. So if you've never just practiced sketching with your pencil, do that because this really helps you. And then I could take and come back out here and do more of these wavy squiggles. And I would be doing this with my needle and my thread. And I would be coming back, of course, a lot neater than what I'm drawing, but I'm just visualizing. And so maybe for that flower that I have, this is the design that I need. So the the block will tell you. And so then when I get here, I can travel and do another section, but this is a section that's manageable for me. So six inches, six and a half inches is about the space that I can hold my hands with, and I can do that quite easily. So that's a good place to start. So I'm gonna bring this over here and I'm gonna try that. So I have my machine and I have it ready and I'm gonna try to start right here in the middle. And I think I'm gonna try this design. I've decided that that feather is not to my liking, but I'm gonna try this instead. And so now that I have visualized it, my brain now can kind of see where I'm going and that makes it a whole lot easier. So now I'm ready to go. So I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna remove the pin that's closest to my six inch grid. And so I have a space right here that's six inches. I have pins on either side, I have pins down here, and I have a pin over here. But I don't want any pins obstructing my path right now. So I'm gonna move my pins. And I'm going to stretch, stretch, stretch to make sure that this is doing what it's supposed to do. And I'm gonna come straight to the middle and I'm gonna pull up my bobbin thread like I did before and leave those tails. So I'm gonna pull that bobbin thread up so I scooch it over. I'm gonna bring that up. See how I'm pulling it? I'm pulling up that bobbin thread so it's on the top side. There we go and I have both pieces right here where it came in, I'm gonna bring my needle back just a hair to the right of where I pulled up that bobbin thread. 
and now I'm ready to start stitching dead in the middle of my design. I'm going to use this particular design, which looks like a big chrysanthemum, because what I'm quilting is a giant chrysanthemum. And so I'm going to start. I'm going to go slow and steady, and I'm going to wrap this around my hand just a little bit, and I'm going to give it a start. So I'm going to wrap this around like this. I'm going to hold it, and I'm going to start my stitching. So now here I go. I'm going to give it a couple of uh, stitches really slow up and down right around the same spot where I started to secure my stitching. And now I can begin the process of free motion quilting. Relax your shoulders. Whatever you do, relax your shoulders, friends. This is very easy to do. You're sitting there like this. You're tensing your shoulders. Do not tense up your shoulders. Make them, make them relax. And then your posture should be relaxed and comfortable and you're gonna have to move your shoulders quite often because you can um, get quite tense when you're free motion quilting. So here I go and now I can begin. So I'm gonna slowly push my fabric and I'm gonna watch my needle to make sure that my stitches are in good shape. So I'm gonna look carefully in here my stitches are looking a tiny bit big, so I'm going to reduce that right there. Uh, I'm going to reduce it to 1.5, and I'm going to keep going slowly but surely. There we go. Now my stitches are the size that I like, and I'm going to be doing a little bit of stitching. And there we go. And so as I go, I'm going to make sure that it's going through all of my layers. And I'm gonna to check to make sure I haven't done anything tragic. And so I'm gonna go ahead and reduce that even more because those stitches are looking way too big and I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of great big stitches. And if your stitches are too big, guess what? You can take your scissors and you go in here and you clip and you get rid of those and you can start again. It's not a big deal. When you start free motion quilting for the first time, become friends with Jack the Ripper, the seam ripper. That's all I got to say. It's just how it goes. Jack the Ripper is my friend. And don't be afraid to use tweezers to get all that stuff out of there and pull it straight up. So if you don't like this, no big deal. Pull them on out of there. And then you can just keep going. And Bertha's not cooperating with me today, and that happens. All right, so I pulled those stitches out. And then we're back to the drawing board. And this happens, friends. This happens in real life, and don't get frustrated. Do not, whatever you do, get frustrated with yourself because you're learning. And then I'm going to pull up my bobbin thread and we're going to try this again. You are learning and it's not a big deal. The first time I tried this um, was an unmitigated disaster, but I've been quilting for a long time. And so the main thing that I want you to do is always be generous with yourself. Do not stress yourself because it's not worth it. All right. I'm going to clip that thread, bring it up, and then we're back at it. Always pull it up. Sometimes I cheat and I don't, and then I always regret it. So pull it up. Get rid of my old stitches that I didn't like because they were way too big. Yep. Oops. Don't hit the camera, right? And here we go. Press your foot down. Everything is ready to go. So here we are. 
I'm going to go slow and steady out. Move this out of your way. Leave those tails. Slow and steady in. Come to the center. Slow and steady out. Like a little flame. Slow and steady in. And the main thing with this is that you just want to be consistent and steady. Always stop with your needle down. Lift your presser foot, rotate it just a hair, smooth it, presser foot down, and continue. So in this case, I'm doing a little traveling flame. It's going to go out, and then I'm coming back in. And I'm liking how these stitches are looking. They're looking consistent. That's the main thing. They can be big, but they have to be consistent. They can be small, but they have to be consistent. And so I'm adjusting that just a hair. Getting all that stuff out of the way. I'm still holding these two tails out of my way. And then I'm going straight out. Tip of my flame and I'm coming straight back in. And I'm just using the, the pressure from my hands. Do you guys have any questions? So somebody said, can you show us how to loose tight the sandwich that should be how loose should it be um my sandwich is is fairly loose and if you notice there's some spring action in this foot right here if your foot is too tight against that then it causes drag um, you can always take this off and put a couple of rubber bands and you can adjust that but it should not drag on the fabric. It should barely, barely touch. So like if you look at my other little presser feet, it should not be pushing down. Does that make sense? Because if it pushes down, it causes too much drag. And so now I'm gonna rotate this design and I'm gonna come back out here and I'm gonna take my hands and I'm gonna come back to center. And so I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to show you some of my stitches so you can see what I'm talking about. If you notice, look at my stitches. They're not itty bitty tiny stitches, which is okay. That's what I want. Um, the faster you move, the bigger the stitches. So if you move your fabric quite fast, those stitches get big. The slower you move your fabric, the smaller the stitches. So your ability to move this fabric controls the size of those stitches okay and like I said before there should be very little pressure this should barely be gliding above the surface it should actually barely be touching so if it's pushed against there really tight like that you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time moving that so that's what I'm working on I'm gonna keep moving these stitches and they're gonna follow the design if this were a block that were a circle or a square, I would follow it out to the edge of the block and then I would come in, follow it out to the edge of the block and come in. And I'm gonna continue doing this for just a minute and then I'm gonna stop and let you ask questions because it is already 3.13. Um, and then I'm gonna have a live Zoom and I'm gonna continue free motion quilting because the rest of the process is pretty much the same. And uh, I want you to have a chance to ask me all the questions that you want. So there we have it. I'm going to continue. Like I said, I'm going to hold these tails out of my way. I'm not cutting them close to the surface. I'm going to bury those later. And so I'm just going to move this. I'm going to carefully roll this in one hand like this. Use my arm to put pressure on it. Move this out of the way. I almost feel like I have to have a stunt double or an extra to help me with all of this. I'm gonna make sure that I'm smooth. I'm checking underneath that I'm smooth. And then I am moving on again, just like I did before, putting my hands flat on either side. Let me show you really close. I'm putting my hands both sides of that, just like this. And I'm evenly moving my fabric. And so it doesn't matter if your stitches are a little bit big at first or a little bit too small at first. The main thing that you're doing is you're trying to get a consistent rhythm.
and that you're learning how to travel. And so you stop with the needle down, and then I rotate that. Careful not to create any pucker, so I'm checking the bottom, making sure that it's smooth and straight, and I will continue doing that all the way throughout this design. So I'm gonna keep working on that for just another minute, and then I'm gonna stop and let you ask me questions. And I have done an entire uh, queen size quilt on this domestic machine that you see right here. So it's no problem to quilt even the biggest of quilts if you just take it in little sections and you stop and you take your time and you check frequently and you work from the middle out. and you just have to practice. There's no way around this one. This is a skill that has to be practiced. So if you notice, you just kind of get a rhythm to it. And every time that the machine takes a stitch, that's when you you take your opportunity to give it a little move. You get you get a little rhythm and you start to feel it. So you almost like push and pull. Every time that the machine, the needle goes up just a hair, that's your opportunity to move it just a tiny bit. And I'm liking how this is looking. It's looking like a little flame. Do you see that? So I'm starting to get some stitches. Now that I'm in the middle and I have just a little section left over here, this is where I'm going to travel to this next area and I'm going to start working my way out, focusing on one of these petals at a time. So I'll focus on one petal, come down to center, travel just a hair, do another petal, come back to center, and I'm going to work my way from the center of this design all the way out. All right, does anybody have any questions about what we covered? Why do I hold the tail? Lori wants to know, why do I hold the tail rather than cutting them off? And let me give you an answer. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to um, not use my thread cutter because I don't use my thread cutter. So I'm gonna pull my needle out and I'm gonna pull this without cutting it and I'll show you why I hold my threads. So when I have this, and I leave that tail, tail here. now I can cut away my bobbin thread. I'm going to put this in front of me, and I'm going to show you why. Okay. If I were to take this and immediately snip right at the surface, right where I've been quilting, and snip it like this, over time that wears and what I can get is I can get a spot where my threads start coming up. So instead of cutting it off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a needle and I'm going to bury it. And so I will take a needle and you do this with um, big quilts. If you do machine quilting on a long arm and you have tails, you leave these out. And so I will take a needle. And I will thread this needle with those tails that I've left out and I will bury them. And by burying them, that ensures that, that my, quilt, my quilting will not come apart right at the start and stop point. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any other questions? Would you guys like for me to do a Zoom after this? 
for you to ask me any additional questions or maybe have me look at your work or let me check out your setup in case you're having problems with tension. So there we go. I have that. So now that I have it, I'm going to come underneath here and I'm going to bury that. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to come in and I'm going to push it so that it, it goes through the, the sandwich and then I'm going to push it out further away and I'm going to give it a tug. And now I'm going to cut that off. So now that I have that and I have that tail and I've traveled a little distance, now I'm going to cut that off because now I know that my thread is less likely, my quilting will less likely come apart right there because I've worked way too hard for my quilting to come apart. And so now you can see I've got my quilt stitches. I've started here in the middle and this is an art quilt. So I've worked my way in the middle and now I can work in another section. And the same thing with this one, I will take this tail and I will tunnel underneath as far as I can go, then pull it up and then snip it. And that makes sure that my uh, quilting doesn't break very easily. All right, friends, it is 3.20. I know that some of you have other things to do. In the next episode of Free Motion Quilting, we will go over how to baste a large quilt, how to manage that, how to use uh, different tools for marking and how to use like six or seven different stitch patterns. So this is just a basic introduction of how to start quilting on a panel. I'm gonna keep working on this, but I'm also gonna start a Zoom. So if you are not a Facebook user and you don't know how to get to our Facebook page, it's at Deli Roll Club. Yes, this will be online for you to rewatch. Um, but we have at Jelly Roll Club, there's a calendar on our website at www.jellyrollclub.com. I'm going to do more of these live events. There's 38 of you. And so maybe the second time we do this, we'll just strictly do a Zoom. If there's not more than 100 people, I can do a Zoom because I have a Zoom room that holds 100. So if you guys would like to be in a Zoom, go to the website, put a comment in there and let me know that you want to be invited to that. And I will put a Zoom link in there, but I'm going to come off of this live and I'm going to go over to the Facebook page and I'm going to start a live Zoom so that you can log in and just ask me what you want. Show me your setup if you need me to give you help or feedback on your machine. So thanks for joining the Jelly Roll Club. I am here to help you. Always free, always fun. This is free motion number one. We have two more sessions. Please let me know if you have any questions. And don't forget to go to our YouTube channel because I'm going to be loading a lot of other things on there. Have a wonderful afternoon, friends. I will see you in a Zoom room in about five minutes. I need a restroom break. Bye-bye. See you in just a few. It's going to be on Facebook. Bye-bye, friends.